The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Jason Lank in studio. As always, we are delighted to have you joining us today. We have a great show lined up. We're going to start today with two ETFs currently in registration with the Securities and Exchange Commission. One is a Bitcoin ETF, and the other is a cannabis ETF. And yes, you heard that right. We're talking about a Bitcoin ETF and a marijuana ETF. And as you might imagine, both of these are generating quite a bit of buzz and certainly some controversy as well. We're going to tell you what the backstory is behind both of these potential ETFs. And we'll also talk about whether there's any real investment merit to either of these. Uh, Jason, interestingly, you can buy marijuana online using Bitcoin. Now, that's not investment advice. Just thought I would mention that. But in any event, we'll start the show today uh, by talking about those two ETFs. And then later, we'll look at the Fed minutes in our weekly market update. And then to close the show today, we have an excellent guest for you. Maz Jadala, CEO and founder of Alpha Clone, will spotlight their Alpha Clone International ETF that seeks to replicate the top international stock picks from the best hedge fund managers. And it also uses a downside hedge in the event of a broader market drawdown. So that should be an interesting spotlight. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit us at etfstore.com. You can email us at advice at etfstore.com, or you can message us through Twitter. Now, as we talk about these two proposed ETFs, this Bitcoin ETF and cannabis ETF, let me first say that Look, we believe the best way to build an investment portfolio is by owning a diversified basket of major asset classes. So U.S. stocks, international stocks, U.S. and international bonds, real estate, maybe sprinkle in a little bit of gold. We think that's the best way to invest longer term. However, there's absolutely nothing wrong with owning some smaller, more speculative satellite positions in your portfolio, maybe in areas where you have really high conviction or perhaps just a strong interest. And so as we talk about these two ETFs today, I just wanted to mention that up front. We're not saying you should back up the truck on Bitcoin or marijuana companies if and when these ETFs come out. But we also think you should know the different options available. And Jason, quite frankly, these would be two very interesting and unique options. We spent a lot of time on the show uh, talking about the building blocks of a portfolio, the major asset classes, and, and, and rightly so. That's so important. But this is fun stuff to talk about. Some of these satellite holdings are interesting, and I think you're right. There will be people that have high conviction one way or another on these asset classes. You know, a lot of people may not have heard of Bitcoin. I think everybody's heard of marijuana at some point in time in their life. But truly, this does illustrate the growth of the industry in terms of ETFs. You can just get your arms from an investment standpoint in almost anything. Now, for people less familiar with Bitcoin, what I, a reference point you might consider is PayPal. You know, everybody that's bought something online, you either used a credit card or, in many cases, one of the big boys, PayPal. And there are other vendors out there, Apple Pay and so forth. But that's where Bitcoin is really making its mark in terms of a means of exchange. Now, the marijuana issue is is interesting, and we'll talk a lot more about that. But it, it, it strikes close to home here. As many listeners know, our headquarters are in Kansas City. Uh, and so our, our neighbor to the west is Colorado. Well, in Colorado, they recently passed legislation at the state level to legalize recreational marijuana. So to think on one side of the border it's legal, on the other side of the border it's not legal, it, uh, there are a lot of moving parts here. And 
the legalization, the, the, the legislative creep we see, and, and not making a moral judgment either way about whether that's okay, but it brings to mind to me casino gambling, I think, as an analogy. You know, 50 or 60 years ago, if you wanted to gamble casino style, you either had to go to Vegas or Reno or Atlantic City. There were very few places to do that. But over the last few decades, you know, reactance and acceptance to casino gambling and perhaps the tax revenue associated with that has really spread. And I read an interesting statistic that right now over 90 percent of the American population lives within one hour of a casino type experience. Maybe that's an Indian casino, a private casino, Vegas and so forth. But it really points out to perceptions and feelings about certain social issues do change and evolve over time. Maybe marijuana is one of those. We'll see. It's a little bit of a wild, wild west out there. Um, but I tell you, when we talk about these ETS, we'll have a little fun. But there's never been a better time to rethink your attitude about satellite holdings. Yeah. Well, let's start with this uh, proposed Bitcoin ETF. Uh, next week, the SEC is expected to rule on whether the Winklevoss Bitcoin Trust ETF, and by the way, the ticker symbol on that would be COIN, C-O-I-N, uh, but the SEC is expected to rule on whether this ETF can begin trading on the BATS stock exchange, and the SEC has been evaluating this proposed ETF since, uh, boy, all the way back in 2013. That's when initial registration was filed on this ETF, but it does look like we may uh, be getting final approval uh, now. And believe it or not, you can actually bet. You can bet on whether this ETF will be approved. You can do that at bitmex.com, which is actually a pretty interesting website. You might check this out if you have any interest in Bitcoin. But right now, they have the odds of SEC approval at about 35%. You know, Jason, if you just take a step back here, you really can't make this stuff up. Here we have a proposed Bitcoin ETF. Started by the Winklevoss twins. Uh, these were the twins involved in the very beginnings of Facebook. Uh, they ended up suing Mark Zuckerberg. Anyone who's seen the movie Social Network will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but then on top of all that, you can bet separately on whether this ETF will be approved by the SEC. You know, it, it, you're right. It's hard to make this up. But but setting aside some of the uh, the curiosities and some of the funnier things, you know, this is a serious SEC filing. This isn't fun and games at this point in time in the legislative process. Um, there's it will be interesting to see how this unfolds because it will hold Bitcoin. Think of when we think of a, a, a an ETF of this type. Think of a gold ETF, you know, a gold ETF, if you want exposure to gold without having it physically held in your, you know, personal safe or safe deposit box, you hold an ETF. And so it holds the gold. This will hold Bitcoin. So, you know, as we look through this, I think the SEC is looking beyond the benefits or, or terms and provisions of the ETF wrapper. You know, we spent a lot of time on the show visiting about, I think what they're going to spend time on, is it legitimate? You know, what will be the regulatory environment? You know, if you deposit money in a bank or buy a CD, there's FDIC insurance for that. The bank goes south. Will there be any mechanism for Bitcoin? Nobody knows yet. The rules haven't been written. Can Bitcoin be hacked? Or can the organizations that hold your Bitcoin electronically be hacked? Could your money disappear? Um, you know, remember, this is an electronic medium of exchange. There's no physical entity here. So uh, they're really looking at, is this credible? Yeah. Here's the thing, though. If the SEC does approve this ETF, I think that's going to be a huge moment for Bitcoin. Because while SEC approval doesn't mean they're endorsing the investment merit of any product, what it does say is that the investment is legitimate. And, and I think SEC approval of the ETF would be lending quite a bit of credibility to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has already developed a fair amount of credibility. You, you look at the price of Bitcoin right now, it's, uh, it's near all-time record highs. Now, to back up here for just a moment, a few weeks ago on the show, we talked about some of the basics uh, of Bitcoin. And I want to quickly do that again for listeners who may be unfamiliar with Bitcoin. And I also think this helps explain the SEC's challenge here. Bitcoin is a digital currency. It's been called the currency of the Internet because you can use Bitcoin to anonymously purchase goods and services online. And the foundation of Bitcoin is what's called blockchain technology. This is basically a chain of data that anyone can verify, and that chain of data can't be altered. So you have a verifiable and permanent ledger of transactions that, that are publicly available to anyone. 
And Bitcoin are created through a computer mining process by actually verifying those transactions. This can get pretty complicated, but the bottom line is Bitcoin is a medium of exchange. It's a way to transact business. And perhaps the biggest selling point with Bitcoin is they're decentralized. They're not beholden to any central bank, and there's only a finite number of Bitcoins authorized. So you can't just run the printing press and create more Bitcoin like central banks can do with paper currency. But, Jason, I I think you're right. All of this is what the SEC is looking into right now. I would argue that they may be behind the curve to some extent. You know, when you talk about what makes a currency or a medium of exchange. You mean the SEC? Excuse me, the SEC. The this is already being accepted by millions and millions of people around the world, different countries. You know, this is truly a borderless phenomena. And it's especially popular, becoming more popular in places where they have run the printing presses, where there are capital controls, where the government can tell you what you can and can't do with your money. With an electronic medium, you can send it anywhere, anytime, to any place, anonymously. And there are a lot of pros and cons to that. You can think of through all the unintended consequences of that type of thing. But when we talk about the term legitimacy, I think we need to look in the mirror at our own country. Look at our dollar. How legitimate is it? Are you willing to accept paper money from your local convenience store and then spend it tomorrow at the dry cleaner? My guess is, yes, you are. It's legitimate. But you know what? In this country, the Federal Reserve is targeting 2% inflation. We spent a lot of time talking about where they want their targets to be before they start raising interest rates. But understand what 2% means in terms of a targeting. They are intentionally waving the flag and saying to every citizen, we're going to debase our currency by design by 2% a year. Understand what that means. You know, what it, would Bitcoin be affected by something like that? Maybe not, because you can't run the printing presses. You know, and you can take it to the extreme, Nate. In Zimbabwe, you know, it's just one of the legendary business cases out there. People have to carry bundles of cash, you know, wheelbarrows full of cash to buy anything because the currency has been debased so badly. It's, it just becomes worthless. It's, it's really kind of funny. The Zimbabwean Treasury actually prints a hundred trillion dollar bill, not a hundred dollar bill, not a thousand, a hundred trillion dollar bill. Now, th- that's amazing. In fact, if you're listening now, tweet us out how many zeros are behind the one and 100 trillion. You might not have enough characters uh, to get into the 140 a character limit in, on Twitter. Y- you might have to use email, <laughs> right. Um, but clearly, legitimacy is in the eyes of the beholder. Well, you know, here's the thing. As we talked about a few weeks ago, you have to remember any currency, including the U.S. dollar, it's simply an IOU, right? A, a U.S. dollar bill doesn't have any value in and of itself. It's simply a piece of paper saying that someone else is going to give you a dollar's worth of goods or services. It's a medium of exchange that's built entirely on trust. You accept my dollar because you know someone else will accept the dollar from you. And the benefit of paper currency is that it makes it much easier to exchange goods and services. And I always like using this example. When you think about paper currency's high level, Jason, theoretically, you and I could start our own currency, and we could create it on those little cocktail napkins you find at the bar, right? If people begin accepting those napkins because perhaps they could take a napkin to the local coffee shop and uh, buy a latte, and then the coffee shop owner could take the napkin to the wholesale grocer and and buy coffee beans, well, guess what? Now we have a currency. Our, Our little napkins would be a medium of exchange. But in reality, nobody is going to accept our napkins. But the difference with Bitcoin is people are accepting them. And as you build trust in a currency, it adds to its viability. Think back to the Civil War in this country. How do we finance it? You know, this is before FDIC insurance. This is before the Federal Reserve. Each bank issued their own banknotes. You know, what, how stable is that? The only reason they had any value is because you trusted the bank. Now, a lot's changed since uh, the 1800s, but it really points that out. The currency markets, you know, many people might not be aware of, you know, why Bitcoin and this ETF are gathering quite a bit of attention. Currency markets, markets rather, are some of the largest on earth. Trillions of dollars, euros, yen, Chinese yuan are traded every day. Think of all the goods and services that flow internationally. Currencies have to be exchanged. 
and there isn't a, a magic fairy that says here's the price of the dollar versus the yen. They're determined in the open marketplace, and they're determined by people's perceptions. Stability. How stable is the currency? How liquid is it? If I buy it, can I sell it? How scarce is it? Are they running the printing presses, or is there a finite amount so I know the game? You know, these are all the same factors that people will consider when they're looking at Bitcoin. Yeah, well, in any event, it's going to be very interesting to see the SEC's ruling on this uh, proposed Bitcoin ETF. You do have to wonder if the Trump administration's more pro-business, less regulation policies will have any impact on the decision-making here. But as I mentioned, if the SEC does approve this, I think it could be off to the races for Bitcoin. You know, this is still a budding marketplace. I saw in the uh, Wall Street Journal that the average daily volume of Bitcoin traded in the U.S. is currently about $30 million. And the Wall Street Journal provided an estimate that at least $300 million might flow into any approved Bitcoin ETF in just the first week. So, you know, think about what that might do to Bitcoin's price. I certainly don't think it'd be a, a negative. And the fact is a Bitcoin ETF makes Bitcoin much more accessible to the average investor and also institutional investors because they have mandates that anything they own in their portfolios must be a registered security, which an ETF would be, but Bitcoin is not currently a registered security. So it would allow them to invest in Bitcoin. So, look, this is going to be very interesting to watch to see if this ETF does, in fact, get approval. You mentioned that institutional investors have certain mandates and restrictions. You're right. That will be a game changer for Bitcoin because it would open up a brand new marketplace, a whole host of investors who haven't been able to participate, even if they didn't want to. Now they can. You're right. There's a finite number of Bitcoin, and it's simply a matter of supply and demand. So we'll see where that goes. You know, for, But from an investment standpoint, um, should you own Bitcoin in your portfolio? Should this be a part of someone's diversified portfolio? Well, I think there's a few questions that every investor should ask themselves. Do you hold any other currencies? Do you trade currencies? Um, it's a very sophisticated marketplace. It's a very deep marketplace. Is that part of your investment acumen? Well, do you own gold is another question. You know, if we talk about the merits of potentially of Bitcoin, you talk about stability of value or it can't be – there's a finite number of them and no central bank can really pull the strings with it. Well, Bitcoin has been called digital gold. R right. And so that for many people, gold is that store of value as that insurance against stupid central banks. It might serve some of the same purposes. And just looking out as a thought experiment about if it's approved and where will some of the attention come from, it, there will be a lot of different angles to this. But I think there will be two major camps. The first camp of people will be the investors. You know, we buy things because we want them to go up in value. And I think, you know, we, you mentioned, Nate, that with the changes in regulations, the increased attention, the finite number of Bitcoin, it may it, – it, who knows where it could go, um, but I think there will also be a very large swath of people who are traders. And people trade iron, people trade gold, people trade stocks. This is just another it's speculation. Absolutely. You know, they're using momentum strategies, they're technical, they're chartist, you know, reading the tea leaves. You know, that's what traders typically rely on are some of those technical factors. Bitcoin is just another marketplace. But you know, to wrap this point up, what's different about Bitcoin is the newness in that it's digital. People have, again, have been trading commodities, iron, cotton, rice, grain, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Bitcoin was invented in the last decade or two. I mean, this is new. And so trading electronic things, digital currencies, um, you know, it remains. We see how this unfolds. All right. Now, the other potential new ETF that's generating quite a bit of buzz right now is a cannabis ETF. Uh, on February 16th, ETF Managers Group filed initial registration for what would be the first marijuana ETF. It's called the Emerging Agrosphere ETF. And, uh, Jason, there's no proposed ticker symbol on this yet, but people have been having a lot of fun speculating. Uh, what, weed? Yeah. Uh, I've seen weed, toke, high, bong. <laughs> no, you know, if you think about a ticker symbol, it's typically four letters. You're right. right? Uh, so, you know, that list goes on and on. But look, he here we have another proposed ETF where perhaps regulatory concerns come into play. Uh, just on Thursday, White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer said that the uh, U.S. Department of Justice would be taking action against states that have legalized recreational marijuana. 
For now, this ETF would only focus on companies involved in medical marijuana, but the door would be left open to invest in other companies if and when the U.S. fully legalized uh, marijuana. And if you look kind of at the entire landscape right now, 28 states have some form of legalized marijuana. Most are just for medical purposes, but there are nine states where it's outright legal to possess marijuana, even for recreational use. And, you know, certainly this continues to be a hot button topic, but even under the current regulatory environment, marijuana is turning into a big business. Forbes recently noted that legal marijuana sales are expected to reach over $20 billion by 2020. They were around $7 billion last year. So you're talking about a 25% plus compound annual growth rate. And there was a quote uh, in Forbes that the only consumer categories to reach $5 billion in annual spending and then post a 25% compound annual growth rate over the next five years, or listen to this, cable television and broadband internet. So, Jason, this proposed ETF would attempt to take advantage of that growth and invest in publicly traded companies involved in legal marijuana in some form or fashion. It, this discussion is fascinating. The, the, the regulatory, the moral environment, the national security questions that have to be asked are continue to unfold because – you're right. I mean, think about this from a moral aspect. Is it, you know, marijuana in itself, is it right or wrong? Is it any different than alcohol? Is it any different than, you know, hard drugs like heroin, something like that? You know, these are questions we have to answer. What message does it send to our kids? Will it be regulated, you know, like, like alcohol is? There's a certain age or, or tobacco, that sort of thing. The The regulatory aspect is interesting, though, because the rules are being written. You know, remember, states often butt heads with the federal government when it comes to rules and regulations. You're right that there are multiple states where medical use and even recreational use are there, but marijuana use is still illegal under federal law. And one of the places that you see this conundrum come up is in banking. And every business owner out there know, you know, probably has a good banker and a line of credit, and you're processing checks, you're processing credit cards. There's a lot of things that go on to running a successful business. How does that work when you're a medical marijuana dispensary? Well, banks that you might work with are regulated by the Fed at the federal level. There are many dispensaries in this industry, and we've talked about how this particular ETF is starting with the big picture and not necessarily on the marijuana sellers themselves, but that forces them to use a cash-only environment. Well, what are some of the problems when a business is a cash only business? You know, we it just it, you have to have to start thinking through money laundering and, and 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 accounting and how that actually works. There's also the revenue aspect of it. You know, politicians beca- can become addicted, no pun intended, uh, to the tax revenue associated with that. And so we're seeing certain states, certainly in the western part of the country, where they're recognizing a lot of revenue, and I think other states are taking notice. Um, Is it any different than taxing cigarettes or alcohol or any of those so-called sin items? One of the final aspects that that you just have to think through this is the national security aspect of this. Um, If we grow our own marijuana here, does that create jobs? Do, Do we then disenfranchise all these Central American drug lords who import marijuana? It might. Think of the what when we when with the illicit drug trade, think of the the money laundering and the corruption that comes along with that. Could we eliminate all that by growing our own? You know, one of the interesting things, this is a this is a, a factoid from Forbes magazine. They quoted that the marijuana industry will grow more jobs by twenty twenty than the manufacturing industry. A staggering. It's amazing. It's just, it's staggering to think that way. So we have to think through all these as you consider a marijuana ETF fitting in your portfolio. But certainly if I'm a Central American drug lord making my living on exporting marijuana to America, it's time to diversify, <laughs> to come up with something else. Yeah, but I think as you hit on, look, there are a litany of both uh, regulatory and, and, and perhaps moral issues outstanding, but it is big business. And, you know, the other thing I would mention is times are changing in terms of public perception. Yeah, now, they are. I, I saw that according to Pew Research Center, Support for the legalization of marijuana had risen to nearly 60 percent among U.S. adults last year. That number was only 32 percent 10 years ago. So support is certainly rising. But in terms of the potential investment merit of an ETF like this, 
I think similar to like we talked about last week with biotech, the benefits of an ETF is you get diversification. And if you think about this area, this is a risky area. This is a fledgling industry. And so if this ETF gets approved, it does offer a way to play the upside of a, a new and growing industry, but without taking an all or nothing approach. And Jason, we do need to uh, head to break here. But again, the reason we talk about ETFs like this on the show is because, number one, we think it shows the innovation occurring in the space. We, we always say how ETFs have democratized investing. They've made certain investments available to the everyday investor that they couldn't have dreamed of accessing in the past. And we think that's important. And then number two, look, this show is equal opportunity in covering ETFs. We cover ETFs that we absolutely love. And we cover ETFs that we wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. You know, ultimately, it's up to you, the investor, to decide what's best for your situation. But we want you to know what's out there or what may be coming down the pike. I think this particular ETF is the poster child for a high conviction, perhaps speculative satellite position with all of the uncertainty from a regulatory standpoint, from a societal standpoint. There's no way it would be a fool's errand to try to pick individual company winners and losers as this soup of companies and changes comes about. This ETF wrapper, this particular one is the way to play it if you have that conviction. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have a, a quick market update, and we'll then be joined by Alpha Clone's Maz Jadala. We'll spotlight the Alpha Clone International ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show, Nate and Jason in studio. Let's go right to our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Stocks were up yet again last week. The S&P 500 was up nearly three-fourths of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up right at one percent. And the NASDAQ was up over a third of a percent for the week. And not a whole lot in the way of market movie news last week. We did have the Fed minutes released on Wednesday. These provide some insight into the Fed's decision-making at their last meeting. And as you might expect, there was a lot of discussion in the minutes surrounding how the new Trump administration might impact the overall economic outlook. Uh, Jason, the money line quote from the minutes was that, uh, quote, many participants expressed the view that it might be appropriate to raise the federal funds rate again fairly soon, if incoming information on the labor market and inflation was in line with or stronger than their current expectations. And, you know, what this boils down to is expectations. We've talked about how the policies Trump is proposing, things like tax cuts and less regulation and infrastructure spending, all of these have helped to boost both consumer and business confidence recently. And that confidence has been reflected in the stock market's performance. But the proof is going to be in the pudding. At some point, these policies will need to come to fruition, and clearly the Fed is watching very carefully to see what Trump will actually be able to get done here. The market has done very well since Trump's election, uh, dramatically well. But I, I, I share your just concern that is, is the tail wagging the dog here just a bit. You know, the Fed watches the market. The market certainly watches the Fed. And I think it's pretty clear that uh, the optimism we've seen about you know, Trump's plan and pro-business activity and tax reform and, and, and all those sort of things. And whatever your political, uh, whatever side of the aisle you're on, it's pretty clear that there is a strong expectation about what the Fed will do. And they better start doing what they say they're going to do. Because I think in the past few years, you know, they've, they've, they've over-promised and under-delivered just a little bit. And so when the expectations of Wall Street meet the actions of the Federal Reserve, I think everybody's happy. People like stability. People like their expectations to be met. If what the Fed actually does is contradictory to what people are expecting, um, that's when people reevaluate. And that's when the stock market, we could see some more volatility. Yeah, and the next Fed meeting is set for March 14th and 15th. And currently, Fed fund futures are pricing in about a 30% chance of a rate increase. So the likelihood of a, a rate increase in March is still fairly low. But if you look out to the Fed's June meeting, the odds increase to about 70%. And again, I think a lot of that is going to depend on what Trump is able to get pushed through uh, between now and then. 
Now, quickly here, Jason, something else that I wanted to briefly mention this week. Billionaire Mark Cuban tweeted out some comments last week. He said that, quote, automation is going to cause unemployment and we need to prepare for it. And this caught my attention because this is something you and I have talked a lot about, both on the show and uh, just in the office. We've talked about how technological innovation and automation, it's highly deflationary because costs for goods and services continue to come down. And you wonder if any of us will have jobs down the road or if robots will be doing all of our work. And I bring this up after uh, mentioning the Fed because I'm not so sure this isn't the single biggest challenge the Fed faces right now. You know, we can talk about Trump or what other economies around the world are doing or or whatever the case may be. But the pace of technological innovation and its impact on prices and uh, employment, this is a story that I don't think is receiving near enough attention. And I I was just glad to see Mark Cuban get this in the headlines last week. I think we need to start thinking more about this. If you were to look out 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, this will absolutely be a talking point. It won't be just something on the fringes. People will be asking from a societal level all the way down, how do we deal with this? You know, for people under, who, who are trying to get their arms around why deflation is a bad thing, there are different kinds of deflation. Prices going down, if, if you're a consumer and you're buying an electronic, uh, a flat screen TV, deflation is a good thing. I can now get a 70-inch TV for what I would have paid for a 30-inch TV just years ago. But deflation also has an, an, an impact on people's buying decisions and when they time their purchases. If you know for a fact that prices will be lower tomorrow than they are today, what's the logical thing to do? Well, you put off buying till tomorrow or the next day or the next year if prices, if your expectation that prices will continue to go down. Well, that's not what the Federal Reserve and the market wants you to do. They want you to buy today. In fact, they want you to buy yesterday. So we can see some of the some of the tremendous impacts of harmful deflation in, for example, like Japan. You know, they've been in over 20 years of a downward spiral in terms of deflation. But on a technology aspect, you know, you can really have a thought experiment about where things will go and what are some of the responses will be to this technological change. You know, there are there are countries and and providences that are experimenting with basic social income. So think social security for the working age person whose job was eliminated perhaps by a robot. You know, are we in a position as society to say everyone, regardless of what you do, regardless of what you contribute, is 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 eligible for a basic human uh, subsistence? You know, my conservative friends might bristle. My liberal friends might say that's great. But that's something that's being discussed right now. I think another, uh, you know, that, that just piques my interest is this aspect of automation and robots and how what's done today by hand and people can be done down the road much cheaper in a deflationary environment by robots. There's speculation and calls for taxing of robots. You know, can we calculate how many jobs a particular robot took away from a human being and tax them for that? I mean, there's so many moving parts here, Well, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, think about this. You know what the number one job in the U.S. currently is? It's truck driver. Well, think about autonomous driving. When you talk about automation, you know, if we have trucks driving around without drivers, and that's the number one job in the U.S., and you talk about uh, unemployment, you know, that's a concern. I just think that's a good example of why this is something uh, that we need to be paying attention to. And I do think the Fed's going to have to be paying more attention to it. Well, in Nate, every single car maker is far, far, far down the line with autonomous driving. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news and there's autonomous cars. You know, if 10 or 20 million people are displaced, the truck drivers, how do you handle that? That's not good. And so this change, we're going to have to get our arms around. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Maz Jadala, CEO and founder of Alpha Clone. We'll spotlight the Alpha Clone International ETF. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci and Jason Lincoln Studio. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,900 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week 
is the Alpha Clone International ETF, ticker symbol ALFI. And joining us via phone from San Francisco to discuss this ETF is Maz Jadala, CEO and founder of Alpha Clone. Maz, great to have you on the program today. Thanks. Great to be here. Love the intro music to your show, by the way. Hey, I appreciate that. Well, well, Maz, let's just jump right in here. The Alpha Clone International ETF, it seeks to replicate the top international stock picks from some of the world's best hedge fund managers. Uh, just walk us through. How, how does this ETF work? Well, as you know, we spe- my firm, Alpha Clone, specializes in building active indexes using Form 13F, which is a required filing with the SEC for institutional investors. It's a holdings disclosure. So this fund, uh, in, in short, aggregates the high-conviction ideas, uh, international high-conviction ideas of uh, institutional investors and hedge funds that we deem to have skill over long periods of time. So it really just tries to give uh, the investor access to, to managers uh, uh, while at the same time foregoing the, the high fees that usually come with accessing really skilled managers. And I know the process you use is something called cloning, and you mentioned the 13F filings. Can, can you talk about this process and maybe how the different hedge fund managers are scored and selected? Sure. Uh, every manager that uh, manages $100 million or more has to file Form 13F with the SEC. It discloses all their long positions at the end of every quarter. Uh, we believe that that form is arguably even uh, better in assessing a manager's skill than uh, looking at the manager's actual performance. That's because the manager's actual performance can stem from multiple sources. The manager could be using leverage. They could be timing the market. They could have trading skill. Whereas if you evaluate them using just their uh, holdings disclosure, Form 13-F, uh, you, you, the only thing you know about the manager is what they held at the end of every quarter. And so it can be a much better way to isolate managers who have true skill over long periods of time. And that's what we call clone scoring. Um, and that's at the heart of how we build all of our, our active indexes. The reason Form 13-F is, is valuable, potentially valuable, is is you know, there's this perception that hedge funds and institutional investors have very uh, short holding per- periods when it comes to their holdings. The the opposite is true. Uh, most uh, hedge funds are fundamental bottom-up managers. Their average holding period uh, for high conviction ideas is uh, over 40 months. So if they file every three months, uh, there can be quite a bit of value in these filings. Of course, the the trick is in, in scoring them and, and knowing which managers have true skill and which ones don't. So as you mentioned, this particular ETF, it holds uh, international stock positions. How many holdings are in this ETF altogether? And can you give us an idea as to some of the top holdings right now? Sure. Um, there are uh, usually between 30 and 40 holdings. Um, and for a while now, and this is true in, in, in the latest rebounds for this, for this fund, uh, the China Internet theme is probably the most dominant theme in, in the fund. C-Trip, uh, Alibaba. JD.com are uh, three of the largest holdings. Uh, but there are other themes as well, including basic materials and healthcare. Now, are there any restrictions in terms of the size of companies that can be held in this ETF? In other words, can this ETF yes. include smaller cap stocks? Yes, it can. Uh, uh, there's a $100 million market cap uh, floor on uh, on being included, but, but that's it. Other than that, uh, uh, you know, the, the fund will tend to tilt uh, large cap, but there, there could be mid cap and small cap holdings in there as well. There's also a limitation on size of the position. No position can be more than 5% weight uh, at, at rebalance. Maz, this is Jason Lank. Um, on the subject of holdings, are there any capacity restraints in the universe that you're looking at? Is there a, a maximum amount of dollars that can chase these great ideas, or, or is the ceiling way out there? It's way out there. I mean, especially with, with Alfie, uh, the index that, that uh, Alfie tracks, as I say, tilts large cap. And, and so, you know, with active strategies, high active share strategies, you know, there's always a, a ceiling. Uh, uh, but, but, but with our strategies, because they, they tilt large cap, uh, it's obviously very, very large. Again, we're visiting with Maz Jadala, CEO and founder of Alpha Clone. We're spotlighting the Alpha Clone International ETF, ticker symbol ALFI. 
Maz, as I understand it, the CTF also uses a downside hedge. Can you tell us more about that? What triggers this hedge? And is this a full hedge on the ETF's uh, holdings? Yeah, it's a dynamic hedge, which means it turns on and off. I mean, our our strategies are for long-term investors. Of course, to be a long-term investor, it means you have to hold your your uh, positions for the long term. And in volatile uh, equity markets, that can be a very challenging thing. So we don't believe in being long only for, for core strategies or or statically hedged, where you're hedged all the time because then you, you're not participating in run-ups in the market. So we have a dynamic hedge. It's very simple. Uh, it looks at the S&P 500 relative to its 200-day moving average at the end of every month. If the S&P 500 closes below its 200-day moving average, we'll move uh, the uh, strategy from being long only to essentially EFA neutral in the case of ALFI. Uh, that's the MSI, MSCI EFA uh, index, uh, which is a broad international index. It'll be neutral that. And is there a reason why you use the S&P 500 moving average as opposed to the MSCI EFA? Is it just because they're so highly correlated? Yeah, we well, these the way we express our international exposure is through American depository receipts or ADRs, and we've looked at using other indexes for the trigger on the hedge. And the S and P 500 hedges the least, but still captures what we call the real deal events, like 2008, 2000, 2001. Um, you know, with dynamic hedges, one of the risks is always that you can get whipsawed, and and you know, we saw that in our strategies uh, in Q4 of 2015 and Q1 of 2016, where you hedge and the market rallies. Uh, but uh, but this particular rule is, has been very, very good at capturing the real deal events where you're seeing 30, 40 percent drawdowns in the market. And, and we think for long-term investors, those are the events that they should really care about, not the whipsaw events. Maz, more broadly speaking, obviously this ETF allows the average investor to easily access some of the best investment ideas from top hedge funds. Can you talk more about what makes the ETF structure so attractive versus just getting these stock picks directly through the hedge funds themselves? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hedge funds and mutual funds are some of the most inefficient investment vehicles around. They're they're tax inefficient. Uh, There's often lockups, as you know, with hedge funds. There's a a high fee structure that comes with those things. Uh, and ETF does away with all that. Uh, it's, it's liquid, it's transparent, uh, it's very tax efficient, uh, it's accessible, and uh, it's relatively lower cost than obviously a 2 and 20 uh, hedge fund fee or, uh, or uh, you know, mutual fund fees. Maz, obviously the ETF is designed to capture some of the best ideas from the best hedge fund managers out there. This is just right out of the headlines. Uh, Warren Buffett released his annual report and obviously coveted by investors around the world. And in it, he kind of lambasted hedge funds and high expenses and fees. Um, But I also noted that he has some high conviction individual holdings. Uh, What do you make of that? And is he talking out of both sides of his mouth? Not really. I, yeah, I wrote an article about this uh, very thing just yesterday, published it on our website. And I think basically what he's saying is that he is a believer in stock picking, but uh, because he is a stock picker. Uh, but for most investors, uh, institutional and individual, um, the, the high fee structure and the inefficiency with which uh, you know they have to go through in order to access skill uh, renders – uh, you know the point moot, and so it's just better to sort of invest in in uh, in the market. Um, of course, what we're trying to do is innovate on how investors are accessing skill, and so we're trying to do away with the high fees and the inefficient uh, uh, you know vehicles. Um, and, and so we've developed these active indexes, um, and uh, and and I think even Mr. Buffett would agree that. You know, the more resilient portfolios will have both very cheap, passive market, uh, you know, strategies that look like the market and uh, and cheaper, efficient, high active share strategies combined. That way, uh, you know, they're a lot more resilient. And so we're trying to give investors the, the high active share strategies without the fees and the, and the headaches. Again, our guest today is Maz Jadala, CEO and founder of Alpha Clone. We're spotlighting the Alpha Clone International ETF, ticker symbol ALFI. 
Maz, high level, where does this ETF fit in an investor's portfolio? Do you view this as a core holding uh, for international stock exposure? Absolutely. The two funds we've got out there, Alpha and Alfie, Alpha is U.S. domestic and Alfie is, is international. They are core holdings. We we uh, like what we call a mirror portfolio construction. Um, for example, if your asset allocation calls for a 40% allocation to uh, uh, international equities, just making this up, uh, we believe you should put half of that in very cheap beta products and half of the other half in very efficient, relatively low cost, high active share products. And, and we like Alfie for, for the high active share component of that allocation. All right, Boz, we have uh, just a few minutes left here, and you began to talk about this just a, a, few, uh, a few moments ago, but I do want to ask you about the age old active versus passive management debate, because I know you do have some rather strong feelings on this. Uh, obviously, the two ETFs that Alpha Clone offers, they're unique because they are essentially hybrids. They attempt to replicate the picks of active managers, but investors get those picks in, in the form of an index fund, and you call this active indexing, as you mentioned. Why do you think this is a better way for investors to invest? Because I think accessing skill is, is important uh, in realizing your ultimate investment objectives. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, incorporating uh, skill into your allocation uh, helps investors achieve their goals quicker, uh, potentially. And so the problem has been that accessing that skill has been super expensive and inefficient. And, and uh, these active indexes try to give investors the best of both worlds, high active share strategies, but offered passively uh, and efficiently. And, and uh, you know, it's hard to make the active argument uh, when the S&P 500 has returned 15% a year over the last five years, but everyone knows that there will come a, a five-year period or a seven-year period where the S&P 500 returns 2%, and, and active strategies will do better than that. And so by incorporating both in your portfolio, you're do doing yourself a service because you're building resilience into your portfolio. Maz, about one minute left. When you look at the proliferation of smart beta ETFs, I'm just curious, do you view that uh, is the same in terms of accessing that manager skill you speak of? No. The smart beta ETFs try to uh, capitalize on known factors. Uh, in the market, for example, small cap stocks tend to outperform large cap stocks. Value stocks tend to outperform growth stocks. Um, and some of them just give you one factor. Some of them try to give you a combination of factors. Um, and so, you know, we don't consider ourselves our, uh, as smart beta. We, we frankly consider ourselves smart alpha uh, because we're trying to package the skill, i.e. alpha, that these managers have exhibited um, and, and and do it in a way that's efficient and, and low cost. Well, Maz, with that, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, fantastic spotlight today. As always, we appreciate you joining us on the program. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. That was Maz Jadala, CEO and founder of Alpha Clone. Again, the ETF is the Alpha Clone International ETF, ticker symbol ALFI. And you can learn more about this ETF by visiting alphaclonefunds.com. That's alphaclonefunds.com. Jason, we have just a couple of minutes left here. You know, when you look at this ETF, again, what it's doing is, is it's taking these 13F filings. Hedge fund managers have to disclose their holdings on a quarterly basis. It's going through those, and it has a scoring process, both to score the hedge fund manager themselves and then select the top stock picks, in this case, international stock picks using the American depository receipts. Uh, and, you know, the thing that always sticks out to me about an ETF like this you know, look at the fee structure. If you want to invest in hedge funds, you have to pay the traditional 2 and 20 fee structure. But here you're getting it for, uh, you know, less than a, a full percentage point on the expense ratio in this ETF. So, you know, when you talk about the innovation in ETFs like we spoke of earlier, this is Exhibit A. Yeah, yeah you can really roll this up. Find someone who's really, really smart, who charges a lot of money, has high minimums, and requires accredited investors, and piggyback on our ideas in a low-cost, tax-efficient vehicle that's the bottom line that's pretty neat concept yeah so again that etf is the alpha clone international etf ticker symbol alfi 
We will have to leave it there as that's all the time we have for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available for free at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. And I always like to mention our guest interviews are available at our ETF Expert Corner. So if you don't have time to listen to the entire podcast but you just want to catch our guest interview, you can do that at the ETF Expert Corner section at ETFstore.com. Both the podcasts and the guest interviews can be played from any device. So any mobile device, you can play it directly from the uh, the, the mobile website. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, we're going to focus on precious metals. Max Gold, Director of Investment Strategy at ETF Securities, will join us to talk gold silver and perhaps even platinum and palladium we'll look at the current investment case for precious metals and we'll also discuss some of the etf options in this space until then have a great week everyone